Well, here we are talking about coaching. My name is Yannick. As always, I'm here with Sivash and Nikki. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, we've got a question today uh, that emerged from our latest cabinet session where there was a new coach and just plainly asked, hey, do you have advice for a new coach? So uh, a lot of really good nuggets came out of uh, that kind of session, but I figured, um, I, I mean, we've all been new coaches, so we can probably reflect on what would, we, what would we have liked to know back then when we started out? What piece of advice would we have liked to have been given by someone? Um, so maybe we can share some learning and I'm, I'm, we, we, there's so much we could share, right? So we said, let's cut this after 20 minutes and just move on regardless of how much advice there is still. So if we still have a long list, we might just do a part two. Uh, but for now, let's, let's do 20 minutes of advice for a new coach. Um, who wants to, who wants to start? Sounds great. Great question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to start. I guess for me, that's still, you know, more recent out of the three of us, And I just noted, uh, noted down some initial notes of things that kind of came to mind when you um, were saying the question. I think one of the most important things for me looking back was the kind of feeling of imposter syndrome, which I'm sure so many new coaches are familiar with. Um, so things I wrote down are momentum. And I think kind of going off the momentum of first starting out and having all that energy and enthusiasm around the topic And really using that to kind of take it out into the world. I think making it real by talking to people, your family, your friends, your immediate surrounding, and maybe other people who are maybe doing a training with you or something like that, to just kind of reflect on how it feels to put it out there and kind of find your own way with it. And again, make it more real. Um, and the other thing I put down is kind of continuity and lots of practice. Again, I think it just feeds into momentum. But also, yeah, just trying to, I think, keep in touch with it on a daily basis, a bit like a practice to kind of create a new routine and mindset and kind of, yeah, make it an everyday thing, kind of living it, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, yeah like when, when writers mind. give you advice that, you know, if you want to be a writer, write every day. Yeah, and yeah. It's, a, it's a bit more tricky to coach every day, perhaps, because it still depends on another person. But you can engage in your coaching practice in some way. If you just read a little bit every day or you talk to someone about coaching every day or you coach every day or you think about your coaching every day, you know, I think that's that's such an important part, making it part of the routine. Exactly. Nice. I wonder, should we do one each or something? Great. Sivash, what do you got? Um, what, what came up for me while Nikki was talking is And, and by the way, my answer will be, I think, different every single time for this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think what comes up for me now is it's almost like, you know, there's, there's a framework, you know, if you, we think about goal setting, right? And, and I think often this is missed. So I think this is really useful. It's like we look at where we want to go. And this is kind of the third question for today, right? Like often it's like, oh, I want to build that six-figure coaching business, right? Um, but we, we want to first look like, my advice would be first look at where do you want to really go? What is that? What's that goal? For example, for me, it was initially to just earn a thousand a month to replace my job. Right. And then, you know, very quickly, my wife lost a job. And I was like, okay, I need to now earn two and a half thousand a month. So I think getting very clear, like, what is it that you want? Is it like a thing on the side? Is it to, you know, to improve your, your skills at your job. And then the second thing that's, I think, missed a lot of time. The first one, I think most people cover. The second one is missed a lot of times is, where are you now? You know, when, when I order an Uber, so I don't have a car, right? When I order an Uber, I first put my destination, but then the Uber like looks at, you know, your current location. I think most people don't really look at this as like, so the mm -hmm. thing that I usually do is, just simple assessment and anyone can do this right now it's like where where are my coaching skills on a scale of one to ten and by the way like most of the time you will give yourself a high number like i give myself probably a seven the first year it was probably a four really mm -hmm. right where are you in terms of coaching skills where are you in terms of sales skills i think that's a really important one and then i also look at like how confident are you in both of these areas and i think in the beginning that's really all you need 
coaching skills, skill skills, and then the confidence around those areas. Mm -hmm. Right? Because then you can also, and then the third thing is making a plan, right? Not making just a plan like, oh, how do I achieve my whatever income goal? But how do I make, how do I get those those areas up? How do I improve my sales skills? I think I was a, a one at, at sales. I was really terrible at that. Would try to avoid it at all costs. So I started reading books on it, right? Invest, for example, in a, in a coaching course. If you don't have the money, then get creative, right? Like there's so many great coaching videos. There's this podcast that can help you really improve your coaching skills, but also can help you like understand this this profession better. And and I think that's that's the other thing, right? Just seeing this very much like becoming, you know, becoming a dentist, becoming a doctor. Usually there's a plan. Sometimes it's a three-year plan, right? And then this will probably, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in our third question, but this is so important, especially for people listening on the podcast, right? Is, you're, you know, you will most likely need to give this at least two, three years before you can get, you can go full-time, right? And I think setting expectations up from the start in, you know, in the right way is going to actually help you succeed more. Like, you know, you're not going to, you, when you're going to becoming a, a doctor, right? You know, it's going to take a minimum of six years and that's just the foundations. Yeah, right? Because there's a system and regulations that you need to go through, uh, certifications you need to get. You know, in coaching, that's a bit different. I, I think I generally agree that it does take a few years, but it does depend on what you're bringing to the table. Right. So if someone comes with lots of people skills, great listener already, just having that kind of coaching mindset already, um, coming out of a corporate career with a great network and lots of people who would love to do some work together, it can go very quickly. And those are usually the examples of these, you know, business courses that get your results quick. You know, and people come in with all these resources that are perfect for creating a coaching business. You know, for some people, it takes a lot longer because, you know, they really struggle to maybe connect with people initially or they're, you know, it's easier for an extrovert to build business than for an introvert in many ways. So it might just take a little bit longer. There might be other skills that you still need. You know, and <laughs> I didn't I didn't have a plan for, you know, uh, I still don't. I mean, I have a direction now, but like I have a different relationship with making plans and strategizing. And the, the sad thing is that I know it works, right? It's just not really how I'm wired. So uh, I, I build a business that worked quite well organically, but it took a lot longer than it, it could have, you know? And I had a job on the side for a, a number of years before I went out to go full-time. Yeah, right? and I, I think that's a really great point as well. Sorry to interrupt you. You know, the, no, the, the job part, I think, you know, if I would start over again, I wouldn't leave my job as quickly. I think I left my job after two months. You know, I, I did. I did at that time. I, I think I signed up four or five clients and I had a few more in the pipeline. And when I left my job, I think I had 15 clients paying thousand each. So that's like 15 months covered. Right. But I think, you know, most people like what I again, what I see is right we put too much pressure on ourselves, right? It's like, oh, it's almost like, you know, you get a medal for who can leave the job the quickest. And, you know, psychologically, it's, it affects you a lot because when you become needy, when you, need, when you need to pay the bills, it takes you out of that flow state, right? And I love what you said there because, and I see this with most coaches is that they perform really well when they can kind of create their own structure where they don't have to like get, when they don't get boxed in into like, or oh, I have to do this at 9 a.m., I have to do this at 10 a.m., I have to do this every half an hour, right? It's just like having space to, to you know, to get into flow and, and not having to worry about finances is probably one of the biggest things. Uh, yeah, some people, they really respond well to, if you want to take the island, burn the ships, right? I think I heard Tony Robbins say that once. And I'm like, it's a powerful statement, but... Some people, they burn the ships and they get paralyzed with fear and pressure and the weight of the responsibility. And that's not going to really help. You know, for other people, it's going to be much, much better to not burn those ships by any means necessary. 
because then they can safely explore. They have a they have a safe haven where they can go back to. And, you know, knowing that, well, if it doesn't work out, I still can pay food and rent, you know, that's, uh, that might help you show up present and focused and motivated. So I think it really, uh, another, that's another advice, I guess, look at the person you are, reflect on who you are, what you're like, how you're wired and how would, what would be conducive, uh, to building a practice and a business. Um, based on who you are as a person. Really nice. I really like that. Okay, what's next on your list? What's next on my list? Yeah. Oh, um, actually one word I put down, but I think it kind of feeds um, into what I was saying before. Another word that came to mind is as someone new and maybe as someone who's kind of dipped in and out of coaching more or less throughout the years because of other things I'm doing in my life, um, the most important thing has been, and actually just thinking of this podcast, is kind of keeping in contact with coaching, even during the times when I wasn't actively coaching. Mm. Um, and again, just having listened to you guys speak about kind of, you know, making, tailoring how you approach going coaching full time, tailoring that to you as someone who loves traveling and also has, you know, surfing, which is a big passion, but takes a lot of time, but still wanting to continue with the coaching. Um, I think the keeping in contact with coaching through reading, um, through podcasts, through being involved in the podcast here as well, um, as well as offering it at where I work, teaching surfing, for example, as well. All those little things have been really important just for continuity again, which I said earlier. Um, so even, even throughout times when it's more or less active, just having that contact with it. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Yeah, I think that's very important. And, and and having a little bit of a, a system, right? Uh, a routine that helps mm -hmm. you become better. Right. And I think again, coming back to um and, and this by the way doesn't need to be too rigid, but having, for example, the few things that I wrote down is you want to be coaching a lot. Right. And and that that's okay. I think even I would and again this a lot of these things that I share is from, from my experience and what's, what I've seen work and what I've seen not work. I've seen, for example, someone that had started at 25,000 and got lucky, got one client, and then for one year didn't have a client and then quit, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other side, I've seen coaches that start at, you know, and there's no right number, but coaches that start at $10, 10 pound, and then 25, and they just get 10 clients, right? And they coach a lot. And I think the more you coach the, you know, if you have also like some, you know, you can do your own feedback, you can have your own review, but if you have a supervisor, if you have someone, like someone to, to sit with and actually look at what am I doing? What am I, you know, what am I doing? Well, what can I improve? Right. So one is like really coaching a lot. Second thing is reading coaching books. I think one of the biggest mm -hmm. mistakes I made in my first year is reading only self-help books or reading like business books, but not reading coaching books. I did my coaching certification actually a year and a half into coaching, right? So, you know, reading actual coaching books and then like looking at, okay, what can I put into practice? Right? maybe we can, you know, maybe Yannick, yeah, you can mention a few good coaching books. And uh, the third thing is getting a coach. And, and here's the thing, it's not, I. I think getting a life coach is so much more important than at the beginning than rather than getting a business coach. And because as you improve your life, right, as you see the benefits of coaching and the impact of coaching on your life, you, you will naturally right, become a lot more confident in selling coaching. But mm -hmm. again, coaching is like almost like an invisible thing to sell, right? But when you've seen the benefit, like, hey, you know what? This is how coaching has helped me, right? The number one person you always need to sell is yourself. And there's no better way than being the product of, of the product, right? And of course, business coaching can be useful, but again, it's, I, I don't think you have to spend a lot of money at the beginning. You know, there are nowadays, there are, again, I'm not gonna say how good they are, but there are nowadays, you know, so many f free stuff on YouTube. Right, there are Udemy courses for seven pound. And yes, if you can, highly recommend at some point, you know, investing in an actual good certification program. 
looking at the reviews, but usually again, they usually start at somewhere like four or 5,000. So that's the investment's a bit bigger. Yeah, I would definitely underline the coach, supervisor, and also mentor. Um, you know, having somebody to discuss your work having a space where you can reflect on how am I doing things and what do I want and maybe draw on somebody who's a bit further ahead in that journey as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely to get just your own coach and a life coach. And I think that's, that's worth investing in because it really helped me to have invested in coaching. The first time I invested like a big sum, it was like 500 pounds a session. Um, I, I was so much more confident later on to say, to offer similar numbers because I had experienced the the results and they came quite quickly <laughs> you know the return on investment was like six weeks and i could not have said that before i had experienced it and obviously it's always context specific and it's different for everybody but that's why i would say it's worth investing in um not everybody's in a position to invest right uh, there's ways in which you can do some of the coaching yourself but there's always somebody who might be looking for a practice client and especially in supervision um, there, there are supervision schools you can connect to and say, hey, is anybody looking for clients? Many supervi supervisors in training are very experienced coaches. So they're already going to help you, even if they do supervision badly in some way, you know, uh, but they can hold space for you to figure that out. Um, some mentors might take you on for free because they're at the, you know, towards the tail end of their career. And they like to support young, promising coaches who are motivated and inspired by them. So it's always worth asking. Uh, definitely something I would underline. And um, another piece of advice that helped me was uh, just own the label. You know, there's a lot of coaches I know struggle with, well, how am I going to be perceived? And I certainly felt some of that, right? What are people going to think about me? Me, the coach, you know, the life coach, what, does, what the hell does that mean? You know, a positive psychologist, like I was, uh, I was concerned about the label. Uh, same with existential coach, right? Uh, I was like, mm, you know, but like, how how is it being perceived? Uh, and in the end, uh, almost every time I was in a conversation after I said, I'm an existential coach, I'm a positive psychologist, or even a coach, um, you know, they might say, well, I'd like a Tony Robbins kind of thing. And it doesn't matter what they first assume. What matters is that then you're in a conversation. And really, that's the crux of it all. Like, how can I have more conversations is a question I would have loved to ask myself a lot earlier than I did. Um, so when I own the label and I talk about what I'm passionate about, chances are I end up in conversations left, right, and center when I talk to people, um, creating more opportunities to talk to people. And it can be done in a million different ways. And, you know, it's not even that I talk to people to sell them coaching, it's just talking to people. Just where can you be more in conversation? You know, it can be a podcast, can be in the pub, you know, can be down in the book club or in the local community, can be out on the street or in the workplace. Just, you know, create more space for conversations. That's going to help you so much. Yeah, I love that. I think, you know, coming back to one of the things Nikki said is, you know, I think it can be really lonely if, you, if you're building this on your own. Mm. So Find, find a community. There are places like we, we have a Facebook group talking about coaching, right? There are lots of places where you can come in, ask questions, and, you know, most coaches are very supportive. Yeah. So find, find a community that's going to, or a group of people that are on the same path. And, you know, be get resourceful. If you don't have money, a lot of coaches in training that need to do their 40 hours, right? You know, you mentioned like supervisors in training, as you can get, you can find people that will give you coaching, or you find someone else that's just starting out. We do an exchange of six sessions each. You know, you coach that person, that person coaches you, or you can find a group of three people where you coach each other. Peer coaching is a great way to grow. You know, I, I think I think the important thing is right here. I think is, you know, I think one of this this belief. I mean, this thing that. One of the problems I think that I see in the industry is that it's, it's often like pushed forward, like, hey, you need to you need to spend a lot of money at the beginning or to make to make this like to become successful at this, in this profession. Yes, at some point you do need to spend money. And I've seen that whenever I do spend it, it's come back to me. But you don't, you, you know, it's not a requirement at the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
there are so many, so many great resources. There are other podcasts like this, right? There are so many people that are giving away a lot of great, great resources for free. You know, like you, even if you can't afford books, right? This is not, you know, this is not necessarily, the, the, you know, ideally like you want to save up a bit of money and buy the books. But I remember like when I started out very early on, and this is to be honest, a little bit even before coaching, I couldn't afford books. I would just find the books on PDF online, right? Or there are books that you can listen to. Or you can go to a charity shop. I think a really important part is just being resourceful, mm-hmm. you know, being creative, asking for help. One of the things that I did, and some of these videos are somewhere on YouTube, is I just start like interviewing a lot of coaches that I that look successful, that were coaching for three years, five years, right? I thought it's a fun project, but I learned a lot from just asking them questions. Hey, what books do you recommend? Right. Um, and in talking about books, let's maybe like recommend a few books that let's each recommend at least one book that's been useful at the beginning. I'm sure there's a list of we've mentioned so many books during the podcast. We haven't, wasn't that our very first episode? We had one early on for sure. I remember also, yeah. I think the very first time when we met in person in my flat in London, uh, we were also streaming live for the very first launch. <laughs> and I think the first question was, what are some books you recommend? Okay. But it would be, would be great to compare it. Um, what, what, what would be yours, Sivas? Um, I think the, the first one that comes up for me is The Coaching Habit. That was really useful. I think it was one of the first few that books. I Michael Bungaistania. Yeah, because that, I think um, his books really helped me see that, you know, giving advice is not useful and you need to like slow down, listen more, ask more questions. But I do think, um, I'm not sure which which book that would be, but I, I do think people need to be getting like a book that actually explains coaching in even more detail. What is coaching, what is coaching, what is not coaching. So maybe a book that's coming up for you. I would go for something that is a more process oriented and kind of laying out the landscape and the basic skills. Uh, so something like uh, the coaching manual by Julie Starr or an introduction to coaching skills by Christian von Neuberg. Uh, there's a, there's obviously there's coaching for performance by Whitmore. Um, but really the other two, are, they're textbooks, right? But they're well-written. So they really lay out, this is coaching and this is what maybe coaching is not. And this is how it compares to other approaches. Here's some of the basic skills and here's some processes that you can use to help guide someone through a conversation. Yeah, the coaching And lots manual. of resources, right? The coaching manual has a whole research section and uh, Christian's book comes with a website uh, with lots of videos that demonstrate how the skills look like in practice. So I'm, I'm not affiliated. I mean, I, I know them both personally, but... Uh, um yeah i'm i'm not benefiting from this it's just i think they're good books cool Thank you. i look forward to checking the ones out that i haven't read yet um i was actually just i really identified with what seva said earlier about you know i'm also very prone and guilty of reading more self-help philosophy and books around the subject of spirituality rather than coaching as in like more technical and practical books about coaching itself so actually my list of coaching Books is not that long, and I don't think the one I'm going to say is um, even so much coaching and more more sales oriented. But it's going to be the Prosperous Coach. I think for me, oh, yeah. that was just a game changer because it gave me a way to relate to coaching and the identity as a coach and um, selling coaching or sharing coaching with others that I could relate to and the other ways I had in my mind, which is more social media and things like that, that didn't feel so natural to me. So that kind of that really made me feel at home in my coaching. Yeah, the prosperous, the prosperous coach. Great book. Yeah, we can't forget that one. And, and by the way, just to add to that, Nikki, I, I, I don't think we should at any point stop reading self-help books or mm-hmm. you know improving ourselves. Because I think that in itself, you know, it's helped me a lot in my in my coaching. If you read some really good ones, they're usually written by masterful coaches. Right. So they they often give you exercise, they give you a process to go through that you can sometimes take take and bring bring to clients. But I think it's finding that balance between, okay, you know, actually reading some coach reading some coaching books. If you'd ask me in the first two years how many coaching books did you read, I probably hardly read any. And Mm -hmm. and I see this with a lot of coaches, they're just reading more and more and more self-help books because also that's usually the easier thing to do. 
right? But we also have this, I think a lot of times there's this misconception around like that coaching is about that. Yeah. It's I, like giving people advice and help giving them tools and techniques. I know it would be hard to stop after 20 minutes. We are over, but <laughs> I can't, I can't help but make this point at the end because I think the reason why so many coaches read more self-help books than coaching books is because on some level, we still think we need to know, right? Mm -hmm. And that goes well with the coaching habit book. And uh, I think uh, Michael um, leaned into that. I think that there was a book called The Advice Trap or something like that. Yeah. Um, so it's the same concept, right? We we're, we don't need to be the experts. We don't need to give the advice. We, I don't need to understand procrastination necessarily to uh, coach you on your procrastination. Mm -hmm. You know, it can help us to know things and it can open up some more questions or maybe some tools or exercises. Depends on what kind of coach you are, right? So if you're a coach, there's plenty of coaches out there who coach from a position of knowing, of having experience in a particular niche, of having lived a particular story and then help other people through that story. But when we work facilitatively, like when we hold space and we offer questions rather than answers or advice or suggestions, you know, that kind of coaching doesn't require you to know anything about stuff. You know, you just, what you need to know about is how to hold a good space. And yeah. knowledge can, is a double edged sword, right? It can really mm -hmm. help you ask better questions, but it can also make you make a lot of assumptions. And then the coaching becomes less powerful instead of more because you, you, now you think you know stuff. Um, so there's no one right way, but it depends on what kind of coach you are. If you're the kind of coach that coaches from with some expertise, yeah, you need to read a lot of help, self-help books and you need to read a lot of science, I think. Um, you know, you need to get that kind of expertise and good information and a process to decide which information are good and not. Um, but if you're more what some people call pure coaching, you know, what's usually being taught in coaching schools, then you don't, you know, it's much more important you read books on coaching than books on any specific personal development area. Yeah. And when yeah. you read books on coaching, it will help you improve yourself. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. You just, it's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Stop. Stop. <laughs> we, we have a lot left. <laughs> <laughs> we might do a part two, but I think at this point, uh, I'd love to hear everybody else's advice to their earlier selves or, you know, any kind of other good suggestions you're picking up. So do feel free to share them with, uh, with our podcast community here or with us. Send us a question, as always, if you have a, a new, fresh one. And yeah, I guess the last piece of advice is have a look through the 60 past episodes and however many future ones there are since we've recorded this, because there's there's a lot of good advice in these. Um, so, you know, it's not that I'm self-promoting. I think really this is going to help a lot of people that are starting out as coaches, which is really what this first season was about. Another season is over 60 episodes. So I guess <laughs> go figure. There's a lot of advice there. Cool. Well, that's end. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you for being with us today. I appreciate your commitment to learning and growing as a coach. Just a few things before you go. First of all, we're doing this for you. So if there's anything you'd like us to talk about, do send us a question. Secondly, we're not doing this for profit, so we rely on your support to help us reach as many coaches as we can. So if you can send this episode to a friend or tell a fellow coach uh, about what we're doing here, maybe you can subscribe or leave us a review or even support us on Patreon. Um, that would be amazing. And lastly, you can find us across all major platforms. So uh, whether you like to watch or you like to listen or you like to download episodes and listen to it uh, in your car while you're driving through somewhere with no internet, uh, you can do so too. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you and I hope to see you next time.